I have no trouble using the word multiverse to describe what we're talking about. Uh, it is a, an ambiguous word, so you have to be careful to instantly say what you mean. There's the idea that cosmologists use, which we call the cosmological multiverse, which is really just the big universe, but in different parts of the universe, conditions can be very, very different. So right here in our universe, we have a certain collection of particles and forces moving in three dimensions of space, but far away, way far further than what we can actually ever see in our lifetimes, there might be a region of space where conditions are very different. There's a different number of dimensions of space, different collections of particles and forces and so forth. So if there are different patches of the universe where conditions are very different, we think of that as a cosmological multiverse. It's distinguished from the many worlds of quantum mechanics, for example, when you have a quantum mechanical observation of a decaying atom or something like that. The idea is the universe splits into all the different possible observational outcomes, and there's a different branch of the wave function, therefore a different world for every possible splitting. And that happens right here in the room. That's not far away at all. And these ideas might be related to each other, but they're different versions of the idea of a multiverse. I think, I like to think of the multiverse as a prediction rather than, than as a theory. I know that when we talk about philosophy of science or the public perception of science, we sometimes try to be careful about distinguishing between theories and conjectures and hypotheses, but working scientists don't really take those distinctions very seriously. You can say, I have a theory or I have a hypothesis, it doesn't really make any difference. There is an important difference between a theoretical idea that you would put forward and then try to test versus a prediction based on some theoretical idea. So you could imagine people going around just saying, well, I, I wonder whether or not there's a lot of different universes out there. And that would not be very interesting. Scientists would not really take that very seriously. But instead, what we have with the multiverse is other theories like inflation, quantum mechanics, superstring theory that we believe in for totally other reasons. And what we find is that these theories predict the existence of some sort of multiverse. So that's why scientists are actually interested in the idea. The first thing I'd like to say about the multiverse is that I don't think there really is such a thing as the multiverse. Uh, you can have theories of physics, theories that try to describe nature, which um, predict that there's a multiverse, and you can have theories that predict that there's only one kind of universe. Uh, and to give you something to compare that to, I would say, uh, think about the theory of elementary particles that we have, which consists of protons, electrons, uh, light particles called photons and so on. And that theory, when you do calculations with it, tells you that there are many different kinds of atoms. You could easily write down a theory in which there would only be one kind of atom. Um, that's sort of like having only one universe versus many atoms being a richer phenomenology, a richer set of features uh, that comes out of that theory. But you have to calculate. Uh, and that's more like the multiverse, I guess. Um, now, it is possible in physics to have a theory that uh, doesn't just give you one set of particles of forces, it gives you a different way of putting empty space together uh, in such a way that when you have excitations on top of that, the things we call particles, um, they would be different particles and forces from the ones that we know and love. And um, theories that predict that kind of thing, we've given that the name the multiverse. But it's just a name. And it's not really that different from having a theory that predicts different kinds of materials with different properties, uh, theories that predict different kinds of atoms with different properties. Um, and so it's really something that is simply a logical possibility for nature to have. And our job is to figure out whether or not that is in fact the correct possibility. Despite what one might naively think, the multiverse is a conservative idea. Throughout the history of science, we kept learning that we are tinier and tinier substance than we thought. For example, our own Earth is only one of the many planets in the solar system, and our solar system is only one of the many solar systems in the galaxy. And our galaxy is also one of the many in our universe, and we are now saying that what we thought as the entire universe is also a tiny part of the whole substance. One might think that's just a naive guess. But something special which is happening right now is that those pictures is suggested by the theory which we learned by exploring other problems. For example, consistency of quantum gravity. So in that sense, this multiverse picture is now emerging as sort of prediction of our latest modern theoretical physics. That's an amazing thing. And one might even criticize also that the multiverse cannot be tested. Okay. 
how you can test something beyond our horizon of the universe. Can you go there? But that's not the legitimate criticism because the multiverse theory, if you study it, you can have uh, predictions from this theory. One example is the sign of the curvature of our own universe, which has a well-defined signatures, which is negative. You can test those things. One might still think that those predictions are not one-to-one. -one, okay? It cannot really directly prove that the multiverse is right. But that's always the case in almost any science which explores history. For example, Big Bang Theory. We believe Big Bang Theory with very high confidence as a scientist. But that's not because I went back and saw the Big Bang universe. We just postulated the Big Bang uh, uh, cosmology and studied its consequences and tested a lot of consequences with the observations. And we are gradually being convinced that that's what happened. So what we have to do here is the same. For the multiverse theory, you really have to keep studying, accumulate a lot of theoretical implications, and went to a lot of observations and compare and see if this theory is something it's suggested by observation or not. So the bottom line is that this multiverse theory, despite some says, is really scientific theory, and the methodology we are adopting here is completely that of science. Well, one way of thinking about the multiverse is that our universe is enormously large compared to the part that, not only the part that we can see, but the part of the universe that we would ever be able to see, even if we imagine that we could wait a really long time, as long as you want. Um, it turns out that we live in a kind of universe where even if you waited for a very long time, um, it's sort of like living in a box. There's a certain distance beyond which you cannot see. And one way of thinking about the multiverse is that there are lots of very, very different regions far beyond that distance, which we will therefore never be able to see. Uh, and if I think of the multiverse in that way, um, it's a nice picture, but it really does suggest that it has nothing to do with science. Because if I can never see those regions, then why am I talking about them? Um, the reason that theories that lead to this picture are science is that they predict stuff about the region that we can see. And that's what I'm interested in. So instead of saying that, well, you know, dragons live far, far beyond that, that uh, cosmological horizon that encloses us and, and we'll never be able to see those dragons, um, let's just say that there was a certain probability for those dragons to have formed in our own universe. That's not what happened, but there are lots of things that perfectly ordinary theories that we know and love tell us have a non-zero probability of happening, and they just didn't happen. You know, this atom, it could have decayed, but that nah, didn't. Um, and the theories that allow for, not dragons, I was joking, but other kinds of particles, other kinds of forces in faraway regions, they also make predictions, they have consequences for what we should observe in the region that we live in. Even if we were unlucky, no dragons here, they still make predictions for which, what we should see when we do an experiment. And that's why I think the multiverse is science. Okay. Yes, I know any comments about this? Oh yeah, I think I basically agree. Um, and also this, this theory is giving us some possible formulation of quantum theory of gravity. So it, it, as he says, we are sometimes talking about outside the box, but how to formulate outside the box, which you may never see. And the, our formulation itself, suggested by general relativity, may be wrong. So this gives some also step forward, theoretically, how to go to our more complete theory of the nature. And that's another aspect. But observationally, yes, too, this theory also predicts things inside the box, or our own universe. And it's good to be, keep testing those things. We're in a somewhat unfortunate situation right now where at particle accelerators, our theory is too good. You know, science moves the quickest when the theory is pretty good, but not good enough. There are data that are not explained by the theory because that gives us a clue as to how to make progress. Right now, we have this theory of particle physics, the standard model of particle physics, that seems to fit all of the data that we're getting 
from high energy particle accelerators, like the Large Hadron Collider smashing protons into each other, seeing what particles come out. Everything that we see that comes out is well accounted for by the standard model of particle physics. We don't think it's the final answer. We don't think that, that we know about all the particles. For example, there's dark matter in the universe, and that's not accounted for as far as we know by the standard model. So we think that there's something more there, but we haven't seen it yet. So therefore, it becomes a bit of a fishing expedition. It's about, you know, pushing our collisions to higher and higher energies, what we call higher luminosities, where the collisions happen faster and faster, and looking for signals that are unexpected. So experimenters who built these machines and are collecting the data have developed very sophisticated routines for searching through this enormous amount of data and looking for anomalies, looking for things that didn't quite fit. Now, if we find something that doesn't quite fit, will it tell us anything about inflation in the multiverse? Well, you can hope, you know, you can cross your fingers and say maybe something like that would be true, but it's not likely, it's not the, the most obvious example. Uh, it's not the most readily predictable thing in the world. So you try anyway, right? I mean, you, you, know, you, you look for things, you're convinced that there's definitely puzzles we don't know the answer to. Why is there more matter than antimatter? Why is there dark matter? Was there inflation? We would love to get new data that is relevant to these questions from particle accelerators. But before we do that, we might have to build a particle accelerator at much higher energies than we currently have. Quite often people say that this is not science, it's not worth doing, I totally disagree. And as I explained in the talk, um, it's really better to follow your curiosity. And if something is interesting to you, you should just do it. And in particular, this, this, this multiples, people have full misconception that this is just a random idea, or just a rough thing, and then, okay, many universes, whatever the many universes, you're just talking, talking, blah, blah, blah. And I don't think that's really dangerous. I wanted to really uh, solve that misconception. And really, this is really the result of following equations. And to try to explain mystery we observe in our own universe. And because, uh, of this um, uh, specific nature, you can really falsify it and you can uh, probe uh, uh, experimental consequences. And it's not really like it's really direct. You may say, okay, it's not really direct, you're addressing it, how you can directly check it. But I'm arguing that it's the same for many other sciences. Okay? And if you have archaeology, you're not really directly seeing dinosaurs. It's not. Okay? You hypothesized based on the evidence we have that dinosaurs were there, that's by far the best explanation of what we see now. Okay? The same thing, to explain what we saw uh, in our observations, and what's the best explanation? And so far, the best explanation we have is the existence of many universes, which is also suggested by uh, the fundamental laws of nature, including general relativity and string theory. And I hope I explain this um, in my talk. And in fact, one of the reasons I myself is working on this is because this gives us further clue of the further clue of the fundamental uh, physics to explore the fundamental physics, especially quantum gravity. If you have really these multiple universes in a huge space time then what you really have to know is in what sense this huge space-time exists. Okay? It may really exist in certain sense, but not real sense, because you cannot explore, you cannot directly go there. In what sense the space-time exists? I think that there's a lot of misconceptions. I mean, there's a misconception that scientists just posit the multiverse rather than predicting it on the basis of other theories that we have. You know, it's not that we love the multiverse. It's not that we want it to be true and are therefore finding excuses for it to be true. It's because it is forced on us by attempts to explain parts, features of the universe that we do observe. We observe that the early universe was hot, dense, and smooth. We invent inflation to help explain that, and then inflation goes and predicts the existence of a multiverse. So it's not that we want it, and it, it may or may not even be there, right? The other misconception I would say is that by invoking a multiverse, we're not doing science anymore. We're just doing philosophy or theology or, or something like that, because we're invoking things we can't see. The truth is that science always invokes things you can't see. 
uh, virtual particles in quantum mechanics are things you can't see. In the 1800s, when people first started taking seriously the idea of atoms, when people like Maxwell and Boltzmann were using atomic theory to explain thermodynamics, you couldn't see the atoms. You had no hope of being able to see the atoms. But they served an explanatory purpose. So what you do is it's not, it's, you shouldn't worry about not being able to observe a certain prediction. You worry about the kinds of things you can observe and whether or not the best theory you have to explain what you observe also predicts something else. If it does, you should take that something else seriously. One common misconception, not just about the multiverse, but about how science works, um, is that, that we somehow prove a scientific theory or we test every single one of its consequences to be sure that it's right. And in fact, that's never what we do. Um, any good scientific theory has essentially an infinite number of consequences, and you don't have time to test them all. Uh, what you try to do is you try to identify certain key sort of smoking gun kind of signatures that the theory would have, something that, you know, uh, either it explains something that you've already measured and no other theory can do it. And one reason why we think the multiverse is interesting is it explains why the cosmological constant is small. Um, or you try to find for something that's, look for something that's built into the theory which is very distinctive, very different, and, and you, go in, you go out and look for that. So for example, after general relativity was discovered, there were a couple things that it explained that nobody had explained before. For example, the perihelion precession of the planet Mercury, some astronomical observation that nobody understood. The theory explained it straight out. That was a good sign. Then you make some predictions and you try to find things that are very characteristic of the theory. Oh, it bends light around the sun in this particular way. Um, and, and you go out and look for them. Now, in the case of the multiverse, it's hard to do that, not because it's a multiverse, but because the fundamental ingredients of the theory are at the most fundamental scale of nature, at the scale of quantum gravity. And any quantum gravity theory is going to be hard to test because technologically it's very difficult to get to those kinds of distance scales. You have to probe nature either at enormous energies or extremely small distances, which are many orders of magnitude beyond what we can do in accelerators today, for example. The alternative is to work out a very complicated chain of inferences that takes you from this fundamental theory where, where you know, at some level it's very simple, at this high energies it's very simple, to the low energies that we can actually access in our primitive experiments. That might be about as hard as taking the standard model of particles that we have and trying to predict from that the behavior of a zebra. Nobody doubts that every part of the zebra is made out of those elementary particles and that they're working together according to that theory. But getting from one to the other, I mean, the level of complexity is such that you know, that's not a very good strategy. And so the art, I think, is going to be figuring out what the right questions are, figuring out the right compromise between trying to go brute force at the absolute fundamental scale, which is currently far outside our technological reach, and trying to derive things which are insanely complicated from the point of view of the fun fundamental theory, and then test those. Neither of those are going to be very good, um, very good strategies, but once in a while an idea comes along, the cosmological constant, that cuts through this. And, and it explains that number. Now we need more than just one number that it explains, but there are others that it might explain. We now are starting to see that um, the reason that the particles we see have the masses that they do has apparently nothing to do with symmetries. We have to find a different explanation. The multiverse might be able to supply that explanation. Maybe we can explain why neutrinos have the masses they do. Um, maybe we can, you know, so, an excellent example is open curvature, negative curvature. That's something that cuts through this confusion and gives you a window. But you have to also get a little bit lucky. In general, what the scientific theory and what the progress of scientific theory means, it's ultimately to explain the same fact or set of facts by a smaller number of axioms or smaller number of assumptions. That's what the progress of scientific theory is is ultimately. And in that sense, uh, the Kepler's three laws are superior than uh, uh, Ptolemy. Okay? Because as far as solar system is concerned, you're probably able to predict the location of planets and so on fairly well 
and the Ptolemy theory, but it, you need a lot of assumptions. But Kepler's way, and you, you, you needed only three, the basic laws. And it's even more general version of Newton's law. It's now, if you make this theory in that way, the smaller number of assumptions, and less depending on the specific system, you can extrapolate that to understand the rest of the universe. You can use Newton's law to calculate really the motion of solar systems in galaxies. Okay? So you just really can ex extrapolate more. Of course, often or sometimes, the measurement you make in the future contradict with that theory. Then you really have to correct that theory or extend that theory to accommodate the new fact. Okay? But then the new fact you try to make in a way that a smaller number of assumptions than patching a lot of correction knowledge. And then history repeatedly showed that that theory with the fewer assumptions is more applicable range is larger because it depends less on specific system you found the, the, the law. And the repetition of that is what the scientific communities are doing or what science is doing. And the multiverse theory is nothing other than that. It's perfectly along that methodology. So despite some says it's because of multiverse, it's outside. No, it's just completely the same methodology. And often that extrapolation is harder to prove or test, or in fact, real proof, as I said some time ago, it's impossible. Okay? You can never prove all aspects. You can never go back, even Big Bang, which we believe, you can never go back and see. Okay? You just test the consequence and consequence, consequence. And for some cutting edge theories, that test is a bit indirect. So you really have to theoretically think. But the methodology is perfectly that of science. And we are just doing that. So the name of the multiverse might be misleading if that gives some impression that that's really myth, myth or some uh, religious thing. It's not. It's perfectly just usual science. Can I say one more thing just to follow up on that? I think that's a really important point and, and a big misunderstanding, I think, uh, about the multiverse in particular, physics in general, is what we mean by a simple theory. A simple theory is one that has few assumptions, few ingredients. We do not mean that it has few solutions. We don't mean by a simple theory that it can only account for a couple of simple phenomena. On the contrary. So, for example, again, the theory of elementary particles we have. Well, it has a handful of elementary particles. And they can account for all the different atoms, molecules, materials, this telescope, this desk, all the infinite I mean, almost infinitely many different ways you could arrange all these atoms. It can account for all of that. We don't go around saying, oh, this is a multi-material theory. It's bad because it allows for many different kinds of materials. We like that. What we like about it is it starts with a few simple ingredients and out comes the rich world that we see. That's exactly multiverse. If you apply to space and time, a lot of different solutions, a lot of different regions, a lot of different poss possibilities from simple theory. And even that was suggested by exploring something else, consistency of quantum gravity, extra dimension, and so on. We did not invent to have a multiverse. Yeah. In fact, the opposite. That's really making us feel like this might be the right direction to go. We're standing next to Einstein's telescope, which is a very inspiring sight. Um, Einstein had his own history with the cosmological constant that we uh, already talked about a little bit. Uh, when he invented his general theory of relativity, the theory that uh, supplanted Newton's theory of gravity and, and uh, gave us a whole new way of thinking about gravity, um, he realized that there was a sort of dial in his theory, uh, one parameter that he could just set to any number he wanted to. Um, that was the only parameter, so it was a pretty good theory. There's not a lot you can adjust in it. But there was this one number. And, and so how, how to go about that? Well, he thought about the predictions of his theory. What did it say about uh, various planets going around the sun? Well, it worked really well. What did it say about the universe? as a whole, well, it, it kind of said that the universe should either be expanding or contracting. And it's very difficult, I think, for us today to put ourselves into the mindset uh, of, you know, 1915, uh, when 
you know, be before that, the entire history of human thought was that the universe is essentially eternal. It was always the same, it doesn't change. Maybe it was created at some point through some process, but it certainly wasn't something that had its own dynamics that would grow or shrink or change in some way. And that was a step too far even um, for Einstein. He could not accept that idea. And so he tried to use his one dial in the theory to make the universe not expand and not contract, but just kind of stay the same all the time. Um, it was a terrible idea. It was a terrible idea. So he called this the cosmological constant. That's the name of the dial. And he, he decided the value of that thing in his theory should be such that the universe just kind of stays put and doesn't expand or contract. It doesn't even work, first of all. It, it's, it's the kind of thing like trying to put a pencil on its tip and keep it there and not make it fall over. In principle, theoretically, this might be possible, but it's very unstable. It doesn't really work. Um, but of course, more tragically, he missed the prediction <laughs> that the universe should either be expanding or contracting, something that was found not that long afterwards by Edwin Hubble. Um, and so he was upset and he said the cosmological constant was really a terrible idea and he set it to zero. And that's fine, it's his theory, he can set the cosmological constant to anything he likes. Um, and zero is a pretty good value, it's, it, until uh, 1998 that was consistent with observation. But, but long before that, after Einstein, uh, but before the cosmological constant was found to be not zero, um, we discovered that there was actually a big problem with it. Not really the dial that Einstein had his theory, in his theory, but there was a different way in which the same cosmological constant enters the theory through the contributions of matter and even of empty space. And this one wasn't a dial. This one was not something anybody got to choose. You had to calculate it. And we had a really good uh, theory called quantum field theory, more specifically the standard model of the particles that we observe. Super well tested, you can calculate a lot of stuff with it very well, but when you ask it, what should the cosmological constant be? How much does empty space contribute to this dial, the part that Einstein doesn't get to choose? It would be essentially infinite. And certainly vastly larger than known bounds from observation, from the fact that the universe isn't exploding or immediately collapsing. Um, and this is the, called the cosmological constant problem. It really doesn't have anything to do with Einstein's adventure of first positing some number and then being embarrassed about it. It's a real problem that comes out of a clash between what we know from a very successful theory, there should be a huge weight of empty space, and what we know general relativity would do with that. It would make space expand or collapse incredibly rapidly and we don't see that. And so resolving that problem has been really one of the top priorities in, in the past at least half century in physics. Um, and currently the multiverse is the only coherent solution. That doesn't mean that we're sure yet that it's the right solution, um, but it is the one theory that can explain in a sensible way why we live in a large region in which the cosmological constant is very small.